So today is, today is the second Sunday of the month of Abib. We are approaching the end of the Coptic year, slowly but surely. So slowly but surely, we'll be reminded of how the Holy Spirit, as everyone has been talking about the last couple of weeks, how the Holy Spirit seals our relationship with God and consummates it and makes it real. And also a reminder that if this sealing does not happen, we make our decision not to be with him. So with that said today, the disciples ask Christ a very important question. A question I wonder about myself and I wonder about a lot. I, well, I love God. We all love God. We all attempt to love God. How do we become great in the person's eyes that we love? So we love God. We want to be good in his eyes. In the disciples' case, they aimed a little further. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Christ's answer was pretty simple. He brought the, to them a little child and he said, if you don't convert and become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't tell them the answer to their question. He didn't actually answer them. Let's notice here. They asked him who's going to be the greatest. He talked to them about who's going to enter. There's a big difference. There's a requirement here. He's not listing out something to only be the greatest. If you want to be the greatest, be a child. He's saying actually a requirement. A truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Of course, when we think of little children, we can think of all what the little children do, the innocence. Sometimes we think of no knowledge, ignorance. Uh, we think of playful. We think of... Uh, young, we think of people running, crying. And that's the imagery that God wanted us to have in mind. But why is that? Okay, let's meditate a little bit on what does a child mean? Who is the child? How do we become this child? First point is, a child knows his identity. What does that mean? No matter what happens, if it's a young child, he will cry. Or she will cry. She knows she's a child. And no matter what's going to happen, she's going to eventually cry. Okay? She's going to eventually laugh. She's going to eventually play. She's going to eventually forgive. She just does things automatically. And she knows who she is. She knows her identity. And that's something actually that she doesn't, or the child doesn't take on his own. It's actually something that Christ is. Christ is always son, forever son, before and after the incarnation, right? So when Christ here instructs us to be like little children, he's actually instructing us to be like him. What is he like? Every moment he was on earth, he was saying what? My father in heaven. Always witnessing to the father. Always saying that the son of man, I am the son of man. The son, you, will, you shall see the son of man coming in the clouds. He's always referring to himself as the son. He knew his identity. No matter what, happened, he acted according to his identity, just like the little children. There's no fakeness. There's no masks. There is no different environments make us act in different ways. It's all the same. A child acting according to his identity, just like Christ. Another example, another point, how to be children. Children are simple in life with one goal. They love. They're going to cry, but they're looking for attention because they love. They're going to forgive because they want to keep playing because they love. They're going to play because they love. They're going to uh, be at peace with people. You know, they're going to, this is, this is something that, you know, as we get older, I think it gets much more difficult. They don't hold grudges, do they? A child plays. Most of the time, fights maybe once a day. Even, you know, there's a routine. They fight or they get in trouble. But then five minutes later, they're back to normal. They're back to playing. They're pl back to joy. They're back to peace. They can't live on without peace inside of them. The first thing on their mind is, I just want to move on and be in peace. And that is actually another example of who Christ is. Christ is peace. He gives us peace. He reconciles us with the Father, therefore granting us peace. Because as we say in the liturgy many times, and as scripture testifies in the New Testament, he is the king of peace. Okay? So, first one, again, 
A child knows his identity, just like Christ knows his identity. Therefore, we must know our identity. And the second one is a child is simple. And we need to learn how to be simple. Sometimes, let's meditate on the simplicity in our day-to-day life. Sometimes, again, as we've said, the forgiving aspect is sometimes hard. It's sometimes, I'm the first of sinners here to say, it's very hard sometimes for me. Sometimes I, okay, I forgive. Maybe I'm going to try to look for the good in the other, give them the excuse, uh, you know, oh, it wasn't their best day. It wasn't, you know, they, they, they must be going through a lot on this day, and I'll give them the excuse. But it's hard for me to forget as well. So I'm still holding something, okay? Sometimes we need to remember that the goal is to actually become children, and that is not a, something that you know, makes us the greatest, that's actually a requirement. And a child doesn't even remember what happens. That's the goal. And it sounds very, very much not human, but it actually, it's very human. But it's human, humanity in its fulfilled sense. Humanity at its peak. Humanity in Christ can do it, just like what Christ does with us, what God does with us, what does he do with us? Does he remember our sins? No. And thank God he doesn't. Once we repent, okay? When we repent, he doesn't remember anything. It's not like he's like, okay, you can get to heaven. Oh, but I remember that one time you did this. And that one time you did that. No. It's a blank slate for him. And therefore, we must do the same. And that's why he's saying here, we must be like children. Another example of being simple in life is the playing. Children play. It doesn't matter what, physical play or board games or they want to run or they want to jump on mom or dad's lap. I don't, I don't know, but they like to play. Do we play? It sounds very weird to say that. But sometimes I don't think we meditate enough on what's around us. We don't actually interact with our environments. We're all on our phones. We're all into our stresses. We're all into work. We're all from home to the... To, to, Cooking to work to friends to we don't take a moment to stop and enjoy. If God didn't want us to enjoy this world, he would have created it in black and white. He did not. He created colors, he created nature, he gave us a church, he gave us the ability to do art. That's why we have a beautiful church, because we give God the best. And we try to beautify. Our church, just like he beautified us and beautifies nature. And we're called to see the beauty in others. We're called to see the beauty in nature. We're called to see the beauty in our environments because God is in every single one of these. I see a flower and I see a beautiful creator who created everything. I see a person who did a good thing. I see Christ guiding him and her and creating them on their image. I see a good servant. I see a good model of Christ. I see anything I see. Even if it's a bench, I see, oh, what an engineer, what a design. This design is from a mind that can create just like him. I see anything and I glorify God. And that's what David did in the Psalms. That's what the prophets did in the Old Testament. That's what the disciples did in the New Testament. When you see all these, I mean, these epistles are praise of God. They start with every epistle with praise. They end every epistle with praise in the middle of it you'll see subtle hints of praise to God. Why? Because the disciples and apostles learned to do this with Christ. Christ told them to sit on the grass before he fed the 5,000. You have to sit down. It's not, there's nothing takeaway. There's nothing called drive through in the spiritual life. You gotta sit down, relax, enjoy the environment. Enjoy everything God gave you. Everything has to be taken slow. Enjoy the time in groups of 50 with your families. You can't, we can't just be going, 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 going because before we know it, life will end. And we'll be like, oh, I had a lot. Didn't make any of it, okay? So, again, first thing is always be like a child in identity. The second thing is simplicity. And we must and we should try our best to forgive like he forgives, play like he does, and have peace like he is and does. What does that mean? God never, of course, when I say uh, play, did God play? Well, he, he called the children to come to him. What did the children, I'm imagining with you here. When he called the children, he said, let all the children come to me. What did he teach the children? Did he sit to them and lecture them? Or did he teach them, you know, a theological lesson? Or he started telling them, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit for there's the kingdom of heaven. That's too big sometimes for children. He must have played with them. He must have went down to their level to associate with them. And that's what we do with our families 
That's why we do with our spouses, and that's what we do with our, again, environment. We enjoy everything that God gave us, including each other, the body of Christ. Another point of how to be like a child. A child creates his own world. What does that mean? I want to read us a, a little story. We all know it from the Old Testament. It's about a woman, one of the most powerful women in the Bible, in Scripture. It's the Shunammite woman. The Shunammite woman had no children, and one day she saw this older man, bald man, short man, and she saw God in him, so she told her husband, hey, this guy keeps passing by us every couple of weeks. Might as well do for him a little room above our house. Think about how logical that is, first off, because we're going to come back to that in a second. But, okay, her husband caved. Eventually, they made the house for the prophet Elisha in the upper room. Eventually, Elisha was visiting this house all the time on his way. It was like his rest on the highway. He would always go into this house, stay in the house, and leave. Elisha was like, okay, I want to do something for this woman. This woman is so awesome, so loving, so Christ-like, so children-like. I want to do something for her. So he asked his disciple, and he told his disciple, what does this woman need? Do you see any needs in this house? I, I'm not noticing anything. So he looked at him, he's like, my master, she doesn't have children. So he brought her, and he told her, just like this time, next year, you will have a child. Eventually, she has a child, the child grows up, the dad is a little distant. The child goes with his dad, eventually when he's older, to the field. Let's read. Uh, this is uh, Second Kings, if you want to ever look at it. And it came to pass, when he went out to his father, the child, to the reaping, that he said to his father, my head, my head. His father said to the servant, carry him to his mother. So he carried him to the mother. And he lay, the child lay on her knees till noon and died. She took him up, laid him up on the bed of the man of God. Man of God, Elijah. Elijah wasn't there yet, Elisha. She went out and closed the door. As she left, she called to her husband and said, Please bring me one of the young men and one of the donkeys. I will ride quickly to the man of God and come back. So he said, Why go to him today? It is neither the moon day nor the Sabbath. She replied, it is well. She sat up the donkey and said to her servant, lead onward and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. She rode and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when the man of God saw her, he said to his servant Gazi, look, it is that Shunammite woman. Please run now to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? It is well with your child? And she answered, peace. Now she came to a man of God, she came to the man of God on the hill, and she took hold of him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. Gehazi, her, his, uh, the prophet's disciple, came to her to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord hid it from me and did not tell me. So she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not tell you not to deceive me? Then Elijah said to Gehazi, Prepare yourself, take your staff in your hand, and be on your way. If you meet anyone, you will not greet him. And if anyone greets you, you will not answer him. You shall lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So Elisha arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the child's face, and there was neither voice nor hearing in the child. So he went back to meet them and told them, saying, while they were on the way, the child is not awakened. Elisha went into the house, and there was the child, lying dead on the bed. He went into the room, shut the door against the other two, and prayed to the Lord. Eventually, he says, he returned and walked back and forth in the house, and went up and bowed himself down upon the child seven times, and the child opened his eyes. Then Elisha called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite woman. So he called her, and she came to him. And he was, he came to her where, came to him where he was, and he said to her, Take your son. So she went in and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went away. Longer story. Why are we saying the story? A couple of things we need to notice here. There's a lot of irrational behavior here of a child not a grown woman. First off, she doesn't tell her husband what happened. Second off, she keeps saying it is well. 
It is peace. Your child just died. What is wrong with you? Why are you keeping saying that? Third thing, she hangs on to a man. And in that culture, you don't hang on to a man. She hangs on to his feet, doesn't want to let go. He tells her, I will send my staff and it will heal. Doesn't want to let go. So why is she doing all of this? Because, as we were discussing, a child creates her own world. What did this woman, I told you in the very beginning, she realized that this is a man of God, so the first thing she did is what? Let me create a new room on top of my house. How many of us here think of creating new rooms for guests we have? It's hard to think of, okay? The second thing is, she didn't ask for anything. You know, this is a man of God. Ask for something. She doesn't. Her own world was enough. I want God. I want to be surrounded by people of God. I want to be blessed by God. And that is enough. Even when God gave her a son, what did she do next? She was happy what she had. She let the son go to the field. She didn't ask. I know this is bad. Of course, the husband should be there. But it's a bad husband. Did she complain? What did she do? She just dealt with it on its own. She knew that, I mean, the child is dead. It is the fault of the husband. He should have taken care of the child. But what is the husband going to do now? She just went straight to God. Irrational behavior. When we think of, let me, let me think of as Michael here, if something happens, please tell your spouse. This, is, this sounds very bad, right? But she didn't do any of that. Her actions are very childlike. She went, the husband asked, is there anything wrong? It is well. The, the Elijah see, Elisha sees her from far away and he sends a servant to ask her, is everything well? And she says, peace. She comes to him and grabs his feet. Why? Why? Because a child creates his own world, surrounded by what helps them be with God. This is like the Shunammite woman versus what was happening around the Shunammite woman. The Shunammite woman was living at a time where everybody was worshiping idols, was putting their kids through things that I don't want to describe now, just so because it's very gruesome. Environments that we shouldn't be in. How many times do we live in environments, go to environments, go to a festival, go to a one-time event in a lifetime, and we say, oh, it's okay, we're celebrating this person. And to me, at least in my, my book, that's hard, because what happens is you could lose everything. For the sake of time, I will just advise you to read the chapter 3 of Second Kings. It's the chapter right before the one we read from. And it talks about a group, a city specifically, that was living in sin. And because of that city's sin, their children died because of the influence that the city was putting on the children. Okay, let's go back to the main topic. We talked about children dying. Let's talk about children that live, us, when we are with God, when we, are, when we know our identity, when we are simple in heart, we are with God. And the third thing that we said is, a child creates his own world. I want to say one story to conclude with. This story is, is current. Abuna Lua Sederos, he's just reposed, and this story happened with him. He had two spiritual children. He grew up with him in a church in Egypt. And these two kids, one of them immigrated to America, specifically New York City. And this, these two kids in Egypt, well, youth, they were going to church together. They were hanging out with each other. They were always praying together, Bible together, tasbah together, service together, all of things together. Eventually, the one stayed in Egypt, got married, stayed in Egypt. The other one came in America, worked in America, never got married. Eventually, this guy knew friends, and he fell into deep sin and lived a life of sin. And sin that we hear about nowadays, okay? Even though this is in the 70s, the story talks about something that we live in today. You can, make, you can make the connections. Very simple life. Very simple life. This man was so heartbroken, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to save himself. And he was crying for his death. What happened is his friend in Egypt heard about him. When he heard about him, he tried to call him. No one is answering the guy's too ashamed to, you know, reach out for help. So what did the guy do? He agreed with his wife. He left Egypt, went, got his visa, came to the U.S. for three days. And he showed up at the guy's door, and they sat together for three days. And the moment the guy saw him, 
tears, of course, and they started doing everything that they were doing together from before. We were talking right now about how a child creates their own world. We need to create our own world because the story goes that these two men, the moment the friend came back to Egypt, the, literally the next day, the guy gets in a car accident and he reposes. And this is in the 70s, so there were cars still with cassette tapes. So the paramedics and the first responders actually uh, the, pull out the belongings of the person from the car and they find that this person who was living a sinful life all their life was because of this one man who came to him and they spent their time in unity together because they created their own environment, their own world. Around Christ, this person was leading to a liturgy. When he was on his way to work, when the truck hit him and he died. Why am I saying this? A child creates his own world. Circumstances are not helping, let's help each other. Let's be surrounded by each other. Let's not, we're not supposed to fight this world on our own. We're, this is not a lone wolf kind of situation where you're supposed to defeat and conquer Satan on your own. We're supposed to be together. Children, stick to parents. Children, reach out to parents. Children, cry to the parents. Children, play with other children. Children, stick in groups. When a child goes away and he goes on his own, what do we say? No, you must stay with mom and dad or you must stay with an adult. Why? It is a dangerous world. We want to act like adults and be alone in this world? Guess what? We'll get picked off. The easiest way to get picked off in a war is not to know that you're in one. We are in the world. Therefore, we are in a war. And if you want to be defeating the world, we must be like Christ, like children, therefore sticking together, creating our own world. Three things we said is, a child always knows his identity. I am a child. I'm not an adult. I can't do it on my own. I need him. I know my identity. I know I'm his son. I know that I need to always, always act according to my identity. The second thing is a child is simple. A child plays. A child forgives. A child prays. A child cries from his heart to God. To others, it is okay to show emotion. Of course, if you notice, the Shunammite woman was resembling all of these, and she was going through a lot of difficult times, and she was distressed. And she was going through a lot, okay? So this has nothing to do, you know, we can, we can be all of this while going through everything in life. The third thing is a child creates their own world. And when we see other children far away, we bring them back to the flock, like the story that we said that happened fairly recently, okay? Child knows his identity, a child is simple at heart, and child creates their own world. Christ said, Assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Glory be to God forever. Amen.